one question that we can now ask over here is what is the minimum possible sample period right remember i am talking about the sample period over here right not necessarily the clock period the minimum possible clock period of course is determined by the critical path of a circuit right but on the other hand if i ask you the question what is the minimum possible sample period that i can use over here look at this equation let's say that i have a simple filter y of n equals ax of n bx of n minus 1 plus cx of n minus 2 right i can then compute y of n plus 1 in terms of xn plus 1 xn and xn minus 1 if i used three separate multipliers for that as opposed to what was used for y of n then both of these y of n and y of n plus 1 could have been done in principle at least in parallel with each other similarly y of n plus 2 could also have been done in parallel right and if i keep on going like this assuming that all of my inputs x of n n minus 1 all of them are somehow available to me let's say that they are stored in a set of registers and are made available to me somewhere there is no theoretical lower bound on how fast i can process the samples okay now this is an interesting concept and you know bears sort of spending a little time thinking clearly about it effectively what we are saying over here is theoretically there is no minimum bound on the sample uh, on the sample rate uh, on the sample interval okay which means that the effective sample rate that can be processed will tend towards infinity because the rate and the period are inverse of each other okay so the minimum uh, of course in practice you know because of the fact that i have to do all these multiplications and additions there will be a finite amount of time required to compute any one output sample the point that I am trying to make over here is in that same amount of time I could also have done a very large number of other multiply adds and got many other sample output samples also ready. Okay, Which means that on average at least the sample period, the rate at which I am, uh, the interval between processed samples can be made arbitrarily small. Okay. However, if I am trying to implement a different kind of filter, in particular an infinite impulse response filter. The situation is slightly different. Why is that? Let's say that I have a very simple infinite impulse response filter defined by this equation y of n equals y of n minus 1 plus a times x of n. Okay, so what will y of n plus 1 be? It will be determined by y of n plus ax of n plus 1. Now here's the catch y of n only got computed here. Right? So until I have computed y of n, I really cannot do anything about y of n plus 1. I could have computed the a into x of n plus 1, yes, and kept that ready. But I can't add it to y of n until I have actually computed y of n. Okay. And this is a very important point to keep in mind, right? In term, one way of looking at it, which we will look at increasingly as we move forward, is to say that we are talking about something called dependencies, right? And what I mean by dependencies is, if you look at the FIR filter, y of n, Right, the nth output sample depends on x of n plus of course it also depends on two other values which were there before that but you know I am not draw, I have not drawn them over here because in the diagram at least they don't they have not yet got those values or rather I they have gone out of the uh, picture that I have drawn over here y of n plus 1 on the other hand depends on x of n and x of n plus 1 it also depends on x of n minus 1 y of n plus 2 depends on these three values and y of n plus 3 depends on xn plus 1, xn plus 2, xn plus 3. Okay. The important point is if I sort of take this left hand side, right, these are the input samples. Right. And in principle at least, I can say maybe all the input samples are already available to me somewhere. Uh, there could be problems in which the, all the input samples are already available to me somewhere. Of course, this is not the case, for example, when I'm directly trying to filter audio coming from an A to D converter. But let's say that I'm trying to process audio that has already been recorded and saved somewhere in memory. Right? Then in principle, all my input samples are already stored in memory in some array. right? And I can sort of obtain all of them at one shot if I so wish provided I have other you know there are other things like is the memory bandwidth sufficient and so on but with some kind of ideal computer at least that's possible on the other hand with an IIR filter once again these are the input samples 
But if I look at the dependencies, the red arrows over here show that this only got computed now. Right? Y of n is computed only after that y of n plus 1 can be computed. Right? So there is a direct dependency between what is being computed and what next needs to be computed. That was not there in the previous case. Okay, And that's an important point to keep in mind. This is actually a sort of crucial difference between the finite impulse response, which is an example of something called a feed forward system, right, versus an infinite impulse response, which is an example of a feedback system. Right? So the fact that in the feedback system, I'm using a computed value in order to compute the next output means that there is a fundamental limit on how fast I can process data. Okay, This comes up and is actually quantified in terms of something called the iteration period bound. We will look at that briefly as we move forward. But it's one of, you know, this is one of the sort of fundamental properties of signal processing systems, which has, which, you know, is, is something that you can't get around by sort of just doing the kind of transformations or parallelism or pipelining that uh, I mentioned briefly and we will be talking about further as well.